No one told me you were famous. You look at all the strange people with that tear in your eye. Hi, this is Gary Duquette for Spartan Youth Radio. I'm sitting with Matthew Haiti. He's here to talk to us a little bit about himself and his new book coming up. So thank you very much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. This is great. So for our audience who don't know who you are or what you're about, can you uh, tell them a little bit about yourself? Sure. I mean, that would probably be your whole audience. But I, um, I'm a writer. I guess I'm still trying to say that and not feel ashamed. That's, that's been my journey over the last few years. But I am a writer, and I work primarily in the theater. But I also work in film, and I'm getting, uh, I'm having my first book published this year. So I kind of dabble in all genres, as we were talking about genres a little bit earlier, in all forms. But I predominantly think of myself as a theater writer. Theater writer. Eh? So uh, your new book coming out. Can you explain who's publishing? What's it? What is it about? And where did it start? Sure. So the book is called "The City Still Breathing." which I heard you had the weaker thans on a while ago. And that's a line, uh, a partially quoted line from one of their songs. And uh, it's actually been in the works for a long time. I started it when I started my MA. So I went out to Fredericton, New Brunswick in 2008. And the very first story I wrote was one of the chapters of this book in my fiction workshop. And it took me about three years to finish it, and I didn't work on it non-stop the whole time, but I was able to get a grant from the Ontario Arts Council called a Northern Writers Works in Progress grant, and that paid for kind of the completion of the work, so I finished the manuscript. And then I researched the different publishing houses. I had, I, I had talked to you about this earlier, Gary, but I had, a, I had a strategy in mind for how I wanted to pursue getting this book published, because I knew it's, it's how difficult it is to get a first work out there. So I had written a book whose chapters, most of the chapters could be broken down. I considered it an episodic novel. So it wasn't really a sequence of short stories where something begins and ends and you can read them all separately. There are a series of stories that interlinked with characters, themes, situations, um, but they could be broken up like a Power Ranger. They could be broken up into parts and function separately. So what, what I wanted to do is be able to publish all these stories as I was writing them. So I could get them out there, get them published, get some credibility for the book, for the longer work, and then present that to publishing houses. So that's what I did. I got a few of the stories published. I identified uh, the first publisher that I wanted to send it to is called Coach House Books in Toronto. They're an amazing small press, uh, would be considered maybe a mid-sized Canadian press. But they're re they publish really beautiful books. They are one of the only two or three in Canada that actually bind and print the books in-house. So they have these giant old presses in their downstairs. And I'm, I'm going to get to go in August and actually watch my book be run off there, which is just fan like fantastic and exciting uh, for me anyway, <laughs> to see this old machinery work. Because I am nostalgic. I love old pieces of equipment. So, you know, I sent this book to them and I waited, I think it was about six to eight months. And then Alana Wilcox, who's my editor, called me and said we'd like to publish it. And I was blown away because this was my first choice of publisher one of my favorite publishers, and it doesn't happen. Usually you, you get rejected. And I've had a lot of experience with that in life. Is You get rejected, you send it out again. You get rejected, you send it out. But I lucked out. Uh, my publisher, we connected. She liked the work. And she's been an amazing advocate ever since. So we're working together right now. We're in the rewriting phase, um, bouncing stuff back and forth. But we're getting close. And it's, uh, it's set, I think, our... our if you call it a debut or a premiere, it's set to come out in October. So October... 12, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned rejection there, and uh, sure. what I want to ask you is uh, how do you deal with uh, rejection, and how are you fighting rejection in the Canadian writing community? Fighting it. I don't think you fight it, you just accept no. it. You <laughs> just bow your head, and you hear the Charlie Brown theme, and you know you walk off into the distance. But I, um, I don't think you have to accept it pretty early. I've always been the kind of person I live with my heart on my sleeve, so... I, I pretty much what you see is what you get with me. I don't know how to live my life otherwise than just being me. And I think that, that makes it a little bit more difficult in some ways because you see a lot of people as they get older, and, and I was speaking specifically in the arts industry, because whether you're an actor, you're a writer, a director, a designer, whatever it is, the work that you present, the work that you give is ostensibly you, right? It's all you have. So when I give a performance, I act, 
it's me doing the work. So if you reject it, you are rejecting me, you know? And, and to some degree, we all say, people always tell you, don't take it personally. I don't know if that's necessarily, you, you shouldn't feel that way. You, should, you shouldn't get sad and depressed and mopey about it. But it is, it is personal. You, you are the one being rejected. Your book is being rejected. But you just have to get used to the fact that that's, that's the game. All, it's one person saying, you know, this just isn't, it's just not in line with what I like. It's not what I think is good. And in that sense, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be insulted. But it shouldn't stop you from going away and making it better and bringing it back. So I guess that's how I deal with it is, you know, I send out a lot of stories. I get a lot of stories rejected, you know, for every 10 rejections, 20 rejections, you might get one acceptance. So it's important to not get too excited about the acceptance. Don't be like, yes, I'm amazing. I've had a short story being published. You just go, great, I'm really glad this is going to reach some people because that's why it is uh, that you do what you do is to reach other people. And in the same way you deal with rejection, you say, okay, that's cool. That, that wasn't for you, uh, but I'm going to work on it a little bit. I'm going to send it out right away again and not dwell on it. So the minute I get a short story back, I take another look at it. I send it out again. And I think, you know, that's pretty much how I deal with rejection at all levels of work is just kind of nod, accept it, hope it makes you better. Okay. So like you said, in our, you were just in our, my writer's craft class yeah. and you're there to talk to us a little bit about yourself, your book and what you do. And uh, I want you to, could you reiterate uh, what you were talking about of genres to our audience? Yeah. So we had a great chat in, uh, and it was actually you that asked the question, Gary, about you know, what, what genres was I drawn to growing up, you know? And I think because I grew up, I, I was, I was homeschooled. I grew up in a house where free play was, uh, not just encouraged, but it was, it was the rule, right? Go out and have fun. <laughs> we were forced to, and we did. My brother and I had nothing but fun for days on end, years on end, really. Anyway, um, because of that, we lived off our imaginations. That was our food. That was our bread and water. And, I think that's why I was drawn probably to science fiction and fantasy from an earlier age because the imaginary possibilities of that kind of work is so apparent. It's right there on the surface, right? Sure, they're parables and parallels to modern day or things that are happening now, but they're couched in magic, right? In, in possibility. So that, I mean, I was really drawn to that growing up. Unfortunately, in the real world, we have a certain degree of stigma associated with genre, right? You walk into a bookstore if you're lucky enough to have a bookstore these days, but you walk into a bookstore, you see, oh, here's the horror section, here's the sci-fi section, here's the fantasy section, and here's the romance section, here's the Western genre. Oh, and here's the literature section. The real writing is all in this section, right? So we have a tendency to not think about genre work as real work. And there is uh, Margaret Atwood, who you've had on your show, who's you know, a fantastic writer, she doesn't consider some of her great work to be science fiction. She says, no, no, it's speculative fiction, right? And I, and I think, who cares what label it is? Uh, it's, either, it's either something great and deep and amazing or not, regardless of which genre it's in. So I don't think that genre limits great writing by any means. There are fantastic uh, works of science fiction. We had talked about Neuromancer. Um, another amazing book is Samuel Delaney's Dahlgren, if anyone's ever read that. Is this amazing epic work completely on par with some of Thomas Pynchon's greatest works or some of those amazing, you know, epic American novels, William Faulkner, something like that. But it is science fiction and it gives some people the hesitancy from accepting it as one of the greatest works of the 20th century. But it is, you know. So uh, going along with that, uh, my father, like when I was a kid, I used to read him stories. I'm like, it was a... Unlike the normal parenting thing where they read you stories to go to bed, I read him stories cool. until he fell asleep. And um, so... How does that imagination inspire you to write now? And how do you think those people who write just literature, how, what do they draw inspiration from if it's just basic work? You know, it's real writing. Hmm. It's a good question. It's hard for me to speak for inspiration for others, but I had, I had a similar experience. I think that's so amazing that you read your dad. Did you, did you, read, did you read books or did you make up the stories you went along? Anything. Like, uh, I remember telling him a story made, completely made up that I went behind our house and found a haunted house and was chased through it by monsters. And then the same thing, too. You were talking like uh, nostalgia in class. You mentioned Calvin and Hobbes, and I used to just read him panel for panel. And then there's also like the school person from the Black Lagoon series. Okay. And, uh, eventually I kind of advanced to like Harry Potter and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, 
if anything, I'm going to be in the same position you are in right right now when I when I'm your age because I had that imagination too when I was a kid. Right. So it's like we're kind of related. Sure, we're like cousins. Yeah. You know, uh, that's amazing though. I think that is so beautiful that your parents encouraged that. And I mean, yeah, I had some experiences in that my we were my mom would read to us, but my dad would sit to us at bedtime and we would do story rounds. So he'd tell a little bit of the story, but like, okay, it's your turn now, you know, so you make it up. I remember being so mad at my brother because when he told the story, he would always win everything and I would be pushed in the background, like, hey, hey, you know, how come your triceratops always wins the day, you know? But yeah, I, th- I think that laid such an amazing groundwork for me in terms of I never recognized genre. I never recognized limitations. So even now when I sit down to write a story or a, or, or a you know, play or a screenplay, I really think about the story. I really think about storytelling as being the most important, is I want something that's gonna excite and engage me. Um, and unfortunately, what engages me is not the everyday. I don't wanna hear about what I did today. Um, I've had a lot of fun doing what I did today, but that's not something that I would expect anyone else to be interested in. That's my own little, little bubble in the world, that's for me. What I wanna hear about is my day if something incredible magical happened. So I want to hear about the magical possibilities of what could have happened with my day, not what did happen. So it's not to say like I love creative nonfiction too, but I really believe there's a creative possibility to any moment in life. And that's what I explore in my work, I guess. And that's where I draw inspiration from is, you know, the what ifs. Okay. So um, you also mentioned uh, nostalgia. You, your book will invoke nostalgia in a lot of people. And what I was wondering is, what age group are you targeting for this nostalgia? Could it be a general one? Or is it like, you know, back in my day sort of thing? Or hmm. <laughs> I, love, I love that. You know, you're making fun of how old I am. Mean, I do that all the time. Like, oh, when I was your <laughs> age, we had the Atari 2600. No, um, yeah, nostalgia has become a very important emotion for me. And I and I. And I'm not sure why, you know, I, I write about the 80s a lot in my work, the 1980s, because it was a time that was built to celebrate youth. It was the first, the 70s and 80s were the first decades, I think, where everything, mass culture, mass marketing, was marketed towards uh, children, the freedom and the fun of things. Before we got into like the wash your hands times and don't go outside and don't talk to strange people, you know, there's a real liberation and a feeling to that. And that's where my nostalgia comes from. It's not going to be for everybody. So... When I write, I never consciously think about audience. There's some writers that will tell you, identify your audience, know where your work is going to land. I think it's important after you've written to be aware of what it is that you've written and how the different parts function. But I don't think you should ever write with that in mind because, again, we're going back to limitations. If I think about this as a children's novel, then I'm going to be really afraid to throw that four-letter word in there, even though that character should say it. That character should say it, but I'm not sure I should, I should, I should censor myself. So never write with limitations. It's something I really believe. Um, but now, having written the novel, where does it land? Uh, I'd like to think the best works can translate uh, across age groups or class groups or limitations. So I, I'm still hesitant to say it's it's a book for adults. You know, yeah. adolescents shouldn't read it because I, I you know I've written I've written an eight year old character. I've written a 19 year old character. And I've written an 80 year old character in this book. And I feel like I can see light from all those viewpoints to some degree, just based on that emotional situation the character's in. So I would like to say it's applicable and accessible to anyone, but it obviously won't be. There are going to be people that will say, this is garbage. You know? So what are your plans for the future? Uh, do you intend to be one of like the big uh, authors out there, like Margaret Atwood? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would like to be eight feet tall. And uh, no, uh, I have no plans in, 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 in the sense of where, because we were talking about stature. I don't know how you can plan that. I think the only thing that I want as a writer is to reach people. And you want to reach as many people as you can because you believe that something you have to say is important enough to share with others. So that's, I think, hopefully, at the very base, that's what any artist will feel. And there's definitely there are people that want to be famous and I think that's a, it's a, a real mistake to make, to plan your career around that, because then you start making the decisions about, okay, I want to be famous, so I need to only publish stuff that everyone's going to read, so how can I do that? I need to write something that has a little bit of sex in it, and I need to write something that has cool characters, whatever it is, you're placing limitations on yourself. So in, in 10 years, 
I hope that I've reached more people than I have today. And that's what I hope continues to unfold throughout life is that as long as I've, I have stories to tell or things to say that I'm connecting with people, because that's all that life is really about is the human connections that you forge. And I'm trying to do it through the things I write. So finally, for any of our uh, audience out there, do you have any advice to any aspiring writers, actors, or anyone just out there in general? <laughs> Don't do it. It's a hard life. That, and that's what I seen in class too, right, Gary, was that anybody that we ever asked that question of in high school or university would tell us not to do it because it was so hard. But if I had advice, I would, it would be uh, what I said to you, which is find your passion, right? There's something out there. You don't have to do one thing for the rest of your life. Never look at that. Um, and I know that we try to force ourselves into boxes to say, you know, you want to be a nurse, be a nurse, do it for 50 years, 30 years, whatever it is. That's life. That's a life. No, what you like is going to change. And when it changes, don't be afraid to jump full force into what you love. But be aware of your passions. For me, that's writing. I'm aware that that is what I need in my life. Anything else can go. I need to have a way to connect to people. So I've embraced that wholeheartedly. When I was 20, I couldn't have done it because I was so distracted. I didn't know what it was that I loved doing. But get there. And when you find out that what it is that you love to do, embrace it wholeheartedly and put your whole self into it. Work hard at it. Don't procrastinate. Yeah. Don't insult it. Take it seriously and treat it like a job. I mean, the writers, writers often have this like, I only write if I feel inspired, right? I want to feel inspired. It's, it's this bull roar because like we don't feel inspired all the time. Some days it's going to be work. Some days you're going to get up and not want to do it, but you still have to do it. So if you're aspiring writer, uh, aspiring writer, find your passion and treat it like a job every day because it deserves that much respect. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. This has been Gary Duquette with Matthew Haiti for Spartan Youth Radio. No one told me you were famous. You look at all the strange people with that tear in your eye. Kiss down left you all alone and you're shaking through the bone. How could she be so cool?